Welcome back everyone, this is Dr. Gallenstein, uh, and here we are again with a brief lecture on the concept of a minimum detectable effect. So minimum detectable effect, or sometimes uh, the same process is called doing power calculations. Calculations. Uh, this is the process that we use to determine the sample size that we want in our experiment. And so this brief lecture is just to review how we go through the process of determining the sample size that we want to use using uh, this methodology, which you, sometimes you'll refer to it, uh, you'll see it referred to uh, with these two names. So first I want to just give a brief introduction conceptually. Then I want to show you the equation and just tell you everything that's in it. And then I'll spend just a little bit of time deepening the intuition, okay? So let's start with an intuition. So, so far in the class, we've talked about conducting experiments. And when we talk about conducting experiments, we typically talk about having some sample, and then we randomly assign uh, some portion of that sample to a treatment group, and then some other portion of that sample to a control group. And we typically take for granted the size of that sample how many observational units there are in that sample. But in practice, uh, we actually need to determine how large that sample size is. We have to decide. We, we get to pick, or at least we have some say in the matter as to how big the sample size is. And in a certain sense, we could say, well, we always want the sample size to be bigger. Um, and in another sense, we could say, wow, well, uh, collecting data and implementing an intervention is quite costly. And so in another sense, we always want the sample to be smaller. So the question is, how do we weigh that balance, and how do we ever decide how big the sample size should be? Well, this is the methodology for doing it. To understand the methodology, or to understand the intuition, let's consider a simple regression model. So if we run an experiment, and let's say this experiment has one treatment group and one control group, then we could run a very simple model like this. No control variables, very simple model. We have the outcome variable here, and we have the binary treatment variable here, equaling one if they're in the treatment group and zero otherwise. And in this context, the estimate, or I should say beta one, is the average treatment effect. And so our estimate of it is our estimate of the average treatment effect uh, on the treated. So that is our estimate of the ATT. Now, when we do an impact evaluation, we're going to get this estimated average treatment effect on the treated, and we're going to use it to perform a hypothesis test. Now that hypothesis test, we do it for every coefficient we estimate. The hypothesis test is a test of the null hypothesis, where the null hypothesis is that beta 1 equals 0. Now we will determine, we will ask ourselves the question, do we reject or do we fail to reject. Now we will choose to reject the null if the p-value is less than a given threshold. So the standard thresholds are 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. So it's when the p-value is below, that is smaller than one of the thresholds, it's in that situation that we reject the null hypothesis. Let's think a little bit more deeply about that. Where does the p-value come from? Well, in order to test this hypothesis, we do a t-test. To do a t-test, we calculate a t-statistic. The t-statistic for this test is the coefficient, or I should say the uh, estimated value of the coefficient, divided by the standard error of that coefficient. We then take that t-statistic, we go to a t-table, or if we're running this in a software, the software does it for us, we go to a t-table and find our p-value. Now if you look at a t-table, um, you'll notice that the larger the t-statistic, so the larger the t-stat, the larger the t-stat is, the smaller the p-value. And so in a sense, if we want to reject the null hypothesis, we need our t-statistic to be larger. Well, how can our t-statistic be larger? Now, of course, I just want to clarify, we want to know the truth, right? We want to reject the null hypothesis if we should, okay? Um, 
And I'll clarify this in a moment. But so suffice it to say for now, we, we want to reject the null when we should be able to reject the null. Okay? And so in order to reject the null, our t-statistic has to be large. Now, how does our t-statistic get large? Well, let's just look at the fraction. So here's the fraction. This is our t-statistic. Now, the t-statistic the gets bigger as, beta, as the coefficient itself gets larger. Okay? And the t-statistic gets bigger when the standard error is smaller. Now, it's important to know that as the sample size increases, the standard error of the coefficient estimate, for reasons we won't go into at the moment, as the sample size gets larger, the standard error gets smaller. And so what do we have here? We have a situation in which our t-statistic will get larger. So let's see, I'll write it this way. t-stat gets bigger if our coefficient is larger and it gets bigger if our sample size is larger. And so if we want to be able to reject the null hypothesis, we can see that there's a certain trade-off. As the size of the coefficient, or I should say it this way, when the coefficient is large, we, uh, put it this way, uh, we can get by with a smaller sample size. We can get by with a smaller sample size. However, when the coefficient is small, we need n to be big. So when the coefficient's really big, we don't actually need a very big sample size in order to reject the null hypothesis. But when the, when the coefficient is small, we compensate by having a larger sample size. All right, now let's go a step farther. So let's be clear here. Beta 1 hat, this is our estimate of the treatment effect. So what are we saying? We're saying when the effect of the intervention is large, we can use a smaller sample size. When the effect of the intervention is large, we don't need a huge sample size to be able to, quote, detect the effect. However, when the impact of the intervention is small, we need a very large sample size to, quote, detect the effect. What do I mean by that? What do I mean when I say the words detect? the effect. What I mean is find a significant coefficient. Okay, let me, let me be more clear about that. Let's say we do an impact evaluation and the true effect is 100. Okay, so the true effect is 100. We go, we get an estimate all right, our estimate is close to the true value. Let's assume we have internal validity. We have a well-designed experiment. And so our estimate is somewhere close to the true value. Okay, and let's say we're looking at the impact of fertilizers on small farmers. A $100 increase, that's a pretty big increase in income. Especially if we said, um, we. in fact, even we could even say that this is um, $100 per year of income, that's a pretty big increase in income uh, for many of the poorest small farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so let's say that's the true effect. If we have a very small sample size, if we have a very, very small sample size, our standard error of that coefficient will be uh, will be very large. Okay, what does that do to our t-statistic? Right, so our t-stat will be beta 1 hat, right, so it is 95, a pretty big coefficient, but if the standard error is really big, then this t-stat could end up being small, where we end up getting a p-value, 
we could end up with a p-value like 0 0.15, in which case, fail to reject. Now that would be a shame. It'd be a shame to fail to reject that null hypothesis. That is, we conclude that the effect is zero, even though the effect is actually quite large. That would be a real shame to reject, to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And why would we be failing to reject the null hypothesis in a case like this? Well, it's because our sample size wasn't big enough. It's because the standard errors were so large that even though we had a large treatment effect, we still failed to reject the null. In this case, we'd be committing a type 2 error. To avoid this problem, we increase the sample size. When we increase the sample size, the standard error will go down. And with that, the p-value will go down. Actually, let me use a color here to indicate what I'm doing. So let's say we increase the sample size. We, get, we included more farmers in our sample. If we include more farmers in the sample, that standard error will go down, all right, which will lead the t-statistic to go up, which will lead the p-value to go down. So maybe we'll get a, a p-value something like this, in which case we can reject the null, and we would be correct. There is a treatment effect, and it's somewhere very close to 95. <clears throat> this is what I mean by detect. For every treatment effect, we have to ask ourselves the question, is our sample size big enough for us to be able to reject the null hypothesis if, in fact, we measure the effect of around that size? So we do a well-designed experiment, and therefore our estimate is somewhere very close to the true impact. Well, we are able to, quote, detect that effect if our experiment has a sufficient sample size for us to reject the null hypothesis when we estimate that effect size. <clears throat> in the scenario here, in the black ink, we committed a type 2 error. We didn't have what we call enough power, I'll get back to that later, in order to reject the null. We failed to reject the null, even though we got a very good estimate of the true treatment effect, and that treatment effect was actually quite large. Okay, So in the scenario in the black ink here, we were not able to detect. So black ink scenario is couldn't detect the effect. We concluded that there was no effect when in fact there was. And we actually measured it quite accurately. But we couldn't detect it because we failed to reject the null. But when we increase the sample size, all of a sudden we become able to detect that effect. So the blue scenario here, we did reject the null. We could detect it. Okay. So that's what I mean by being able to detect an effect. All right. So now what's this minimum detectable effect that I'm talking about? So we see that there's a trade-off. As the effect size gets bigger, we can get by with a smaller sample size. Alternatively, for very small treatment effects, we need a larger sample to be able to, quote, detect it. That is, be able to reject the null hypothesis when we estimate that effect. And so we find ourselves in this interesting situation where we need to ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, what is, we need to ask, what is the smallest, what is the smallest treatment effect that we want to be able to, defect, to detect? Uh, sorry. What's the smallest detect? What is the smallest treatment effect that we want to be able to detect? Now that sounds like a strange question. The, the implicit assumption might be, well, we want to uh, be able to detect any effect size. But now let's think about the scenario. I'm talking about small farmers in Africa. Let's say a bag of fertilizer costs, costs uh, $120. 
the treatment is to give away a bag of fertilizer. Well, if the treatment effect is $100, it might look big, but actually their incomes aren't even going up high. They aren't even going up enough to compensate for the cost of the bag of fertilizer. So in fact, we would say this isn't big enough. We don't care. Even if the intervention causes an impact of $100, we, it really wouldn't matter to us to be able to detect it because it wouldn't be worth implementing this program even if it did increase it by $100. So we would say this $100 is below what we call, or say it's below the smallest effect that we're interested in. We only want to be able to detect effect sizes that are relevant to us. So let's say, okay, a bag of fertilizer costs $120. The only way that this fertilizer program would be worth it to us to implement is if the treatment effect, is if the treatment effect, I was right, it's beta one. If the treatment effect is $150, or more. Anything less, for, anything less than that is just not worth it to us. It doesn't, it wouldn't cover the cost of the fertilizer and the cost of implementing the program. So the only effect size that we're interested in is an effect size of $150 or more. So this $150, this $150 becomes what we call, or what we will set as our minimum detectable effect. This is something that we choose. I'll write it above. We choose a minimum detectable effect. We choose the smallest effect size that we want to be able to observe. The smallest effect size that we want to be able to detect using our experiment. Then we choose a sample size that will allow us to detect it, to detect, oh, I spelled that wrong up here, detect, that's funny, all right, I did, yeah, detect, yeah, okay, all right, then we choose the sample size n that will allow us to detect that minimum detectable effect. All right, this means that if we choose this particular sample size, we will be able to observe, that is we will be able to reject the null hypothesis for any treatment effect greater than our minimum detectable effect. So here's the conclusion, let's be clear about this. So if beta one hat is greater than or equal to 150, we will be able to reject the null. If beta one hat is less than 150, we won't. But it doesn't matter. We've decided, we've picked the minimal detectable effect that matters to us, so, but uh, we've, we've picked the minimal detectable effect that matters to us, and so we aren't actually concerned if the treatment effect is smaller than that. We, don't, well, we aren't concerned about our, our, our ability to detect it when the treatment effect is actually smaller than that minimal detectable effect. So, so if the treatment effect is lower than 150, we won't be able to detect, we won't be able to reject it all, but it doesn't matter to us but it doesn't um, matter to us. We're okay with that. Okay. All right, so that's the concept of a minimal detectable effect. So basically what we have is that we can write an equation. We can write an equation like this. The minimal detectable effect is equal to something. In fact, we can write an equation where the minimal detectable effect is a function of the sample size. And so what we can do is we can write this equation, plug in all the information that we need to plug into it, and then solve it for n. 
and that n will be the sample size that we need in order to get, in order to be able to measure or detect our minimum detectable effect. So what we will do is we, we choose the minimum detectable effect, we choose this, then we can solve the equation I'm about to write for the sample size that will, um, that will allow us to detect the minimum detectable effect that we choose. So let's take a look at the equation. So we're going to start off with a simple, a simple experiment. Okay, a simple experiment. One treatment, one control group. Okay, same thing. Also in this experiment, assume that we have perfect compliance. We have perfect compliance, and we randomize. At the, at the units of observation. So let's just say farmer, at the unit of observation. So just as an example, we can say the farmer. Okay. All right. So here's the equation for the minimum detectable effect in this context. Okay. So we're just gonna write this out. T alpha. Uh, T alpha, that is the T statistic that corresponds to an alpha of our choice. Alpha is the significance level. So I'll write significance level. Typically, we choose 0 0.05, aka a 5% significance level. So you just look that up on a T table. And the T of 1 minus K, I'll explain this one in just a moment, because we haven't seen this notion of K yet. Okay, Times the square root of 1 divided by p times 1 minus p, okay? Here, p is equal to the proportion of the sample in the treatment group. Okay, all right, times the square root of sigma squared, I'll explain that in a moment, divided by n, okay? Here, n, I'm using capital N to refer to the sample size. So actually, just to be consistent, let's use capital N for sample size, okay? Sigma squared, this is the variance of the, what we use for this is the variance of the dependent variable or as we typically refer to in this class, the outcome variable. Okay. Now, we have everything here except for this t of one minus k, so let me explain what this k is. k refers to something called power. Okay. And actually, I will explain power a little bit later in the lecture. I just wanna make sure I get to the whole equation um, and then I'll come back and explain power uh, later. But we typically choose a power of 0 0.8. And so the T statistic here, T alpha, that refers to the T statistic that corresponds to a significance level of 0 0.05. And then T sub 1 minus K, that would be the T statistic that corresponds to 0 0.2, 1 minus our level of power. Okay. So we look these two things up on a T table. All right, so we look these two up on a t-table. Okay, p-value, this comes from our experimental design. Sample size, we solve for this. And the variance of the dependent variable, we have to look this up. We look for this um, in past research, other research that has been done in the area or other research done on the same topic as we're doing our research on. Okay, and so what we do here, we have the equation and we can fill in all of the variables in the equation except for n and then we can solve this equation for n and that would give us the sample size that we need for this experiment. Okay, so this is a simple experiment. Actually, let me I'm going to write this a little bit more clearly so you can take careful note of it. Okay, so this is a simple experiment. 
All right. When I simple experiment, I mean the randomization at the level of observation. Okay. And perfect compliance. And one treatment, one control. Okay, so what we would do is we just solve this equation for n, n will be our sample size. Now, what if we had two treatments? What if we had two treatments? How would we do this? Well, we would solve this equation for n, and then we would multiply the final n, our final n, we'll just say our final total sample size, maybe I'll give it this a, a double n symbol here. All right, our final sample size would be n times 3 halves. So that's what we're saying here is we want our, we want our treatments uh, and our control groups all to be the same size. So we're, we're going to compute this um, we're going to compute this equation assuming one treatment group and one control group. And that will give us the sample size that we need for one treatment group and one control group. But we want to add a second treatment group. And so what we do is we take the n, um, divide by 2. That would give us the sample size we need for a single treatment group. And then we add that into the total. So that just comes out as n times, uh, n times uh, 3 over 2. Okay, we use the same logic as we increase the number of treatment groups. All right, but now what if we do a cluster randomization? So what if we do the cluster randomization? Now cluster randomization is when we, uh, instead of, let's say, you, let's go back to our example of farmers, this will be helpful. A cluster randomization is where we are measuring information at the farmer level, but we randomize at the village level. That is, we're randomizing at some higher level. All right, so we randomize at a higher level, at a higher level than the level of observation. All right, still assuming perfect compliance. Okay. And uh, we always write the equation as if there's only one treatment group and one control group. If we, have, if we have more than one treatment group, we just need to multiply it by the appropriate fraction. Okay. So if we want to do a cluster randomization, then we need to account for the fact that within each cluster, within each cluster, we are going to have, um, let's see, we're going to collect data on farmers within each cluster, but the randomization is happening at the cluster level, right? So now we need to determine the sample size, that is, the number of clusters, in this case, the number of villages. So we need to calculate the number of, of uh, we need to calculate the number of villages and we need to include the number of individual farmers that we survey within each of the clusters. So how many, how many farmers are we going to survey within each village? And how many villages are we going to include? All right, so a cluster randomization becomes a little bit more complicated. But the equation really is not too bad. All right, so we're primarily interested in the number of clusters, right? We've always talked about we need to, um, we need to have a sufficient sample size uh, at the level of randomization, right? That's what we've always talked about so far. So, right, so we're gonna, we're gonna pick an MDE, we're gonna solve it for N. Now N is going to be, N is gonna be the sample size of clusters, okay? And we're gonna solve this equation for capital N, all right? But it's gonna have a few more terms in it. So, uh, we start off the same, minus k, all right, we still have this term here, okay, and that's multiplied by, same as before, square root of 1 divided by p1 minus p, okay, and same as before, variance divided by capital N, 
But now we had to add another term that takes into account that we have all of this data for people inside of the villages. That's the Greek letter rho, divided by lowercase n. So now lowercase n is going to be the sample size within clusters. Okay, everything else here is the same, although now we also need to take account of this row. What's this row? The row is what we call an intra cluster correlation. Intra cluster correlation is how similar people are within the clusters, how correlated their outcome variable is within the clusters. And so if all the farmers in the village are all very, very similar, they are all around the same age, and they all grow the same crop, and they all have the same amount of land, and they all have the same amount of income, and they all have the same family size, if they're very, very similar, then the intra-cluster correlation will be very high. If, alternatively, they're very different, if uh, instead, uh, there's wild differences in the amount of land that they have, and the household size, and the income, and what crops they grow, and all these things. If there's big differences between the farmers within the village, then the intra-cluster correlation will be low. This is something we typically pick. We pick this, we make an educated guess. If we have data on it, we can calculate it. Like if we have data, let's say, from a baseline survey, we can calculate. Okay, or if we have data from some other source, we can calculate. Uh, but otherwise, we have to make an educated guess as to what the intracluster correlation might be. But once we have all this information, oh, we also just have to pick this. We pick this. We choose it. I'll, I'll put choose here. There's a little more. So we choose this. All right. And once we have that, we can solve for n. And that will be the number of clusters a.k.a. the number of units of randomization. All right. Now, let's say we're going to add one more case here. Actually, I'm going to do this in just a different color. All right, so let me use a different color. I'll use gold here. So if we have imperfect compliance, If we have imperfect compliance, we have to add a term. We're going to multiply the equation by 1 divided by s minus c. And either way, whether it's an individual, whether it's a regular randomization or a cluster randomization, we multiply it by 1 divided by s minus c. Well, what is s? This is the percent, let's put it this way, this is the, um, the proportion of the treatment group that receives the treatment, that receives the intervention. Okay, and C is the proportion of the control group that receives the intervention. Okay, so if there's imperfect compliance, we have to account for the fact that we have imperfect compliance, and we do so by including that extra term. Now, for these, for these, we make educated guesses. Okay. And then we calculate n. We calculate that sample size. So this is how we do it. Now, in practice, what I would recommend and what I typically do is I open up an Excel file and I type in all of these values so that I can change them. I, I type in all the values. I type in all the parameters, and then I type in the equation, and then I can um, use that equation to, to calculate the, uh, the sample size uh, 
that I need. Okay, so that's what I would recommend.